Okay, welcome everybody. Dr. Tro Kalasian is a board certified internal medicine and obesity physician who received his medical de degree from Turo Medical College and completed his internal medicine residency in the Yale New Haven Health System, where he served as the chief medical resident during his time there. He is currently rapidly publishing his own clinical research and regularly analyzes the latest research on obesity, wellness, lipid, and keto nutrition. Dr. Tro has published research on the topics of achalasia, binge eating disorder, food addiction, and severe hypertriglyceridemia. Having said all that is available on the internet regarding his background, I would like to add my own personal experience and knowledge of Dr. Tro. By happenstance, I caught an episode of the Low Carb MD podcast hosted by Drs. Tro Kalajian and Brian Lenskis. I was fascinated by their personal and professional journeys to the low carb diet sphere. Like many of us working in healthcare, they were very frustrated by the failure of, their adv of the advice they were giving their patients to eat less, move more, heart healthy grains, low fat, all the while writing more and more prescriptions for the chronic diseases brought on by this failed advice and patients growing sicker and sicker. Personally, Dr. Tro has recounted his lifelong struggle with anorexia and then obesity. He had tried to, he has tried taking his own advice. Thus began his journey to wellness, massive weight loss, better focus and less stress. He has found his happy place de-prescribing medication, and helping his patients lose massive amounts of weight, all while on a sustainable diet. So please join me to welcome Dr. Tro Kalajian to University Hospital's APP Grand Rounds. Thank you, Dr. Tro. Thank you for that uh, introduction. Um, yeah, uh, that, was, that, was, that was very kind words, and I would say very accurate. Uh, you know, you might as well do my bi bi whole biography pretty much there. I Look, um, I'm going to share my screen and, and, and start with the presentation, but I think you covered that well. I'm going to be talking today. I am ABIM certified. I am ABOM certified, so I got a board certification in obesity medicine. Uh, and I started this journey when, when my um, wife said, hey, we want you alive. You know, uh, that was the, can you guys see the, the slides? You can see the slides? Yep. Okay, perfect. We can. So this is actually me uh, in 2014 as chief resident. Uh, you know, I, I didn't have a lack of knowledge. I, I, I didn't have a lack of expertise in my life. I went and saw the brightest dietitians. I spoke to the smartest endocrinologists and cardiologists. Um, and I clearly had willpower. I had enough of a work ethic to be a chief resident, uh, and so, and to become a, uh, uh, a physician. And yet, uh, I found myself unable to maintain weight, which is part of our dietary guidelines. In fact, the dietary guidelines say weight control. That is their advice. Control your own weight guys. Right. So to, um, battle this, I really went to the medical literature. I just started where any of you would start, right? If it was, you know, somebody had a valve that was going to be replaced, you'd go to literature and say, okay, what's better, you know, a TAVR or an open procedure? Or if somebody had pneumonia, you'd go to up to date and say, okay, what's better, moxifloxacin or, or leave, you know, levofloxacin, you know, which one has a better adverse events profile? You'd look, okay, what are the other options I have, right? So I started just there. I said, you know what? Everything they told us, the guidelines, the calorie counting, I'm going to put it aside. I'm going to go back to the literature. And when I went back to the literature, what I found was calorie counting was never beneficial, never worked better than any other diet. And in fact, uh, other diets consistently work better. And in fact, you know, um, Atkins had it right. Consistently, when you look at comparative diet trials, low carb always performs slightly better for weight loss. Now it's not a huge amount. It's in standard weight loss trials, it's about five pounds. But if you're a person who struggled your whole life, if you know what it's like to have colleagues say you should eat less and move more, if you know what it's like to get up on an exam table that cannot support your weight, if you know what it's like to go to a waiting room and have armrests on the chairs that you can't fit in, 
right? If you know what it's like, you're basically gonna, you want the best possible advice, right? You don't want kind of the standard approach. You wanna know everything about exactly what to do, right? So that's where I started and that's where my journey started. I've since read uh, thousands of papers. I have uh, read uh, at least 300 diet books, four obesity textbooks. I've published papers on obesity. Um, and I can tell you that our, our profession has it really wrong. And my life's focus is really to reframe how we treat obesity. Okay. Not only how we treat obesity, um, but how we view it. It is not a calorie problem. Okay. And I really vehemently, I'm going to go discuss this topic today. So um, I hope you enjoy it. Let me give you my quick disclosures. I failed Weight Watchers and low fat, and I found personal success with low carb and intermittent fasting. So that's a bias I want to disclose. I have a practice that uh, supports this kind of approach. Um, I am a podcast host. It's, it's a not-for-profit podcast, but you should know it's called the Low Carb MD Podcast. So you're getting this bias when you hear a presentation from me. My wife owns a company that sells almond flour uh, based cookie and cake mixes instead of Duncan Himes. So you should also know that, you know, I have a spousal uh, uh, disclosure that I'd like to make. So what are the objectives today? I wanna to review the incidence of obesity and comorbidities. I wanna review the dietary guidelines and nutritional epidemiology. I'd like to review the data regarding calorie information on the behavior of eating. Right, And I want to review the neurobiochemistry of appetite and satiety. What makes you hungry? What makes your patients hungry? And how will this knowledge of hunger help lower their uh, intake and help them uh, successfully? And let's say you're like, Tro, that's all great. That knowledge is wonderful. But tell me what else is available. We'll also talk about medications and surgery towards the end. Okay, so the ignored pandemic, uh, this is from the CDC. This is how obesity has spread throughout our country over the last 20 years. Uh, well, we've all focused on uh, COVID over the last two years, it's actually worsened. You can see that obesity has spread uh, pretty much unmitigated as if all of us are not here. Uh, so what's going on? And I wanna talk about that. You can see since 2008, uh, in fact, in the last two years, since 2008, the number of states with 30% obesity went from six states to 45 states. That was the last graph in that, uh, that last map you saw. This is from the CDC, by the way. The number of states with at least 35% of residents who are obese uh, has doubled, okay, since 2018. So the obesity epidemic has worsened, has literally worsened. The rate of obesity has increased during the pandemic. And so this is something that we'll need to start considering as more and more patients get vaccinated and as, the, uh, as this pandemic dies down, uh, we're gonna be left dealing with the obesity, diabetes and mental health epidemics that are yet to come and probably have actually been here long before COVID. Um, so uh, despite the boom in dietitians, personal trainers, health coaches, doctors, drug surgery, you know, amazing dietary guidelines, really obesity has worsened. Um, you can see on the graph on the bottom there that our obesity has just skyrocketed despite the amount of dietitians, doctors, nurse practitioners, uh, apps that you count calories, uh, commercial weight loss programs, these have all increased and yet obesity is unmitigated. And if you go to our, so I'm, you know, obesity medicine certified, I'm uh, board certified. And when you go to these conferences where all the best and the brightest get together, they put these really complex graphs up like this, I think really to make themselves feel smart. And they have a lot of different uh, contributors to obesity. And it's viewed as, as a, you know, uh, things that happen inside the, the person and outside and what leads them inside to eat more and move less and what, and what is going on outside to, you know, eat more and move less. And this is the central paradigm that they look at it, um, and which is kind of sad. Uh, you know, they put here physical disability and they put social anxiety, they put as reasons for decreased uh, expenditure, basically moving less. And over here you see increased in, you know, intake reasons are, you know, 
uh, basically uh, uh, disordered eating or emotional issues or you know environmental food cues, commercials. Uh, they they come up with a, basically a thousand and one ideas. And I think uh, the way I like to think about it is if if you're a true expert, you should be able to explain it to a six year old. And when you go to these conferences, you walk away knowing that they don't know much. They don't know much at all. Okay, uh, they complicate it. They don't know what they're dealing with. And I think that, I mean, we all know that, right? If they knew what they were doing, we wouldn't be in the problem we're in. And where has all this information led to? You know, the dietary guidelines get together every five years and they try to figure out what to do. And this is the healthy eating pyramid from Harvard. And you see that, you know, over here they say, you know, to be healthy, just keep your weight under control. Well, that's great. You know, if anybody could do that, over 50% of America is either overweight or obese. So, uh, and you'll see here, their guidelines say have, you know, healthy oils. And for Harvard and the food pyramid, the soybean oil used by Nabisco, Wendy's, Burger King, every Chinese food restaurant, that soybean oil is actually considered healthy because it's a vegetable oil. And the grains, the processed grains that are used to coat the chicken on the chicken nuggets, those are actually considered healthy, those grains, right? So, uh, you know, the whole grain Cheerios are considered healthy. They have a heart stamp on them. You know, that you should uh, eat your, um, you know, cinnamon toast crunch has a heart health symbol on it. So uh, the problem is, is uh, a lot of interest, business interests have infiltrated a lot of our nutritional programs and even our dietary guidelines. And so we're left with advice that really uh, seems questionable at best. But this is what we're left with. When you send your patients to a dietitian, this is what they're going to get. Here's the food pyramid. Here's my plate. These are how much vegetables you have, have a small amount of protein, and this is what it should look like. This is the basis of the guidance they're going to get. And did Americans do that, right? Over, you know, about 60% of Americans have actually followed the guidelines, right? So they literally, you know, two thirds of, of people are actually trying to do what we're telling them, right? Like we told people to mask up and, you know, everybody masked up. We told them to stay at home, they stayed at home. And, you know, Americans have done what we've asked them to do, and roughly about 60% of people have done it, and yet the obesity epidemic has worsened. And have we succeeded? Absolutely not. Over three-fourths of, uh, uh, you know, adults are overweight or have obesity. I mean, it's just astronomical. Um, and the rates have increased. 40% of children are either overweight or obese. These are children, okay? They, you know, they don't cook. They can't go and buy healthy foods, right? They're relegated to what is in front of them. They're relegated to what's in the schools, right? So our children are experiencing a diabetes, okay? Diabetes and, and obesity epidemic. They're having fatty liver. Our children are having fatty liver at pandemic proportions. And I think we really have to start to reevaluate what we're doing because it's not working. So should we be focusing on calories? Uh, this has been the approach for the last 50 years. My point today will be, no, you shouldn't, okay? And the most common diet advice that you all give your patients, uh, when, you know, I say you all, but I mean our profession gives our patients, it's eat a low calorie diet, cut your calories, or eat a low salt diet. This is the recommendation. This is the most common statements from doctors and dietitians. Eat the size of your palm, count your calories, eat less and move more. Why don't you use my fitness pal, track your caloric intake. So these are the typical recommendations we make and it's not enough, okay? It's really not enough and it's probably not appropriate. So I'm gonna show you why counting calories is, is not appropriate. We've known essentially since the 1980s um, that you know, tracking calories, food logging is basically in, you know, inaccurate. Patients don't do it well. And even if they do do it, uh, it doesn't lead to weight loss. So when people track their calories or count their calories, statistically, they're not going to be uh, more likely to lose weight. And this is, uh, this is one of the earliest studies in the 80s showing that. Uh, since then, there's been a lot of meta-analyses, one in 2008 uh, by Harnick and French, and a follow-up in 2014, which literally took all of the data in the literature looking at uh, does calorie labeling and uh, calories on menus, does it help anybody uh, lose weight. And in fact, it doesn't. In fact, in this 2014 meta-analysis, they said we should really rethink our, the effectiveness of, of calorie labeling as a policy. 
Okay. And then uh, Brownell did a great study where he basically said this was kind of around the time where several cities were considering mandating the calories on the menus. He went to McDonald's, Burger King, Starbucks, and Bon Pon, and he basically gave people access to calorie information. And he found that about 0.1% of people actually used that calorie information or went to it, meaning at the point of sale, nobody really cares. Once they've gone to eat, they don't care about the calories. They're not interested about the calories and they're not going to check the calories. So uh, maybe instead of thinking about calories, I'd like to get you to start thinking, should we be figuring out what is it that leads people to eat? Why do they eat? And can we teach them ways to eat that will make them less hungry? But I'm going to focus in on a little bit calories. This was a study in fact, in a uh, college uh, environment where they actually showed uh, people at the point of purchase their calorie information, their price information. And in fact, men, when they were showed calorie information, they actually ate more calories. Um, and the list really goes on and on. This was another study done in a college where they showed the nutrition labels and the labels actually led to people eating more than less. Um, so, uh, you know, if you're not starting to question what we're doing now, I'd like you to do that. Even when you take dietitians and doctors and ask them to count their calories and estimate dietitians are off by about 10 to 20%. Okay. They underestimate. And then the average person is off by 20 to 30%, uh, when they estimate their calories and log their calories and people with obesity are disproportionately, uh, off, right? So patients with obesity are up to 50% off. So basically, uh, you know, it, they, they can't even do, people can't even do this well. We can't even do this well, the dietitians and the doctors. So why are we asking our patients to do this is beyond me. Uh, this was an excellent study I found. This is a study in 2000 in Denmark where they literally controlled the calories. They gave people a fixed calorie diet and they compared it to an ad lib crappy diet. I'd say crappy diet is a low fat diet. Okay, so the diet that's failed the past half century. Um, so if you look at uh, a calorie control diet, it actually performs worse than even a low fat diet. So I'm not sure that even telling people to do a slim fast or, or calorie controlled diet is an effective strategy, even compared to an ad lib low fat diet, like go just cut out the fat and, and that's all you do, meaning it's worse than the worst diet calorie counting. And uh, here's an example. If you're tell, ever told your patient to use MyFitnessPal, these are the downloads of MyFitnessPal over the last five years. And uh, there's more and more MyFitnessPal downloads and yet no uh, end in sight to the obesity epidemic. And this was a study that looked at how much people like using those apps. And in fact, the majority of people using those apps when surveyed say they do not like using those apps to track their calories. They voiced frustration with it, uh, and they found that uh, it actually saps their motivation. Uh, they, don't, they actually don't feel motivated by counting their calories. So bottom line is, even when they're doing what you tell them, okay, it's not working as a population, uh, even when you compare it to other bad diets, it doesn't work any better, calorie counting and calorie tracking and calorie logging. And uh, even if you show information, like this is how many calories it has, wait, just stop, just think about the calories. It actually makes some people eat more and most people, it doesn't affect their intake at all. So should we focus on calories? Well, look, uh, that when we analyzed the difference in New York City uh, prior to the calorie mandates on menus that they had, there was no difference in intake. There was no difference on the choices people made at the point of sale. Um, basically there's two, there's another study shown by Brown. It was a great study showing that, uh, basically most people cannot estimate calories, even, you know, our fitness trackers and all that don't estimate it well. Um, and, uh, when we compared the New York city calorie law versus a nearby city, Newark, which is demographically very similar there, there was no difference in intake of fast food, uh, of eating a fast food. So bottom line is, should we keep focusing, focusing on it? Um, this, this, <laughs> you know, this, I tell you a bit, bottom line is this. Okay. Um, if it doesn't work, right. This is a fixed diet plan versus a calorie count counting diet plan. They did a comparison and basically found, uh, where if you gave somebody a fixed diet plan or a calorie counting diet plan, there was no difference in outcomes. Meaning like, look, bottom line is 
this doesn't work. It's too hard. The advice to do it is too hard for most people. Uh, and even if they do it, they're, um, it, it doesn't really address the reasons for eating, right? It doesn't address the reason why they're at that fast food place. It doesn't help them change their behavior at the diet, you know, at the fast food place. And even if they are tracking and logging their calories, they're going to be wildly off. Even dietitians and doctors are off by 20 to 30%. Uh, even if you force the approach and put the calorie labels on the menus and force people to track and lock, it doesn't uh, track and log. It doesn't have any difference in uh, impact. It doesn't, it, doesn't, it doesn't help anybody. That's the bottom line. It doesn't help anybody. Despite the un near universal uh, amount of calorie information now out there with apps and labels, it hasn't really made a dent. And as an intervention, calorie counting, point tracking, Weight Watchers, Slim Fast, they have never performed better than any other diet. In fact, they've performed worse than low carb diets in several meta analyses. So what I tell you is it's over, it's over. Just let's stop, let's stop doing it. So I'd like to propose maybe a slightly different approach. Uh, my, my uh, if you have a highly motivated patient, you may wanna consider instead of focusing on calories, it's easier for you to focus on calories than actually teach them what drives human intake. Right. It's easier to say, go track your calories and push the responsibility on them. I'd implore you to support them, teach them about hunger. Why, why are you hungry? Why are you eating? What are better ways you can eat to address your hunger? Right. You're going to have to, uh, you're going to have to surpass an incredible amount of shame, guilt, emotions, right. And you're going to have to deliver really effective, uh, advice. And one of the places I would start in people that are highly motivated is teaching them what basically makes them hungry, right? Just that concept alone, if we can explain what makes humans eat, um, I think that would probably be better. And so what I'd like to focus on now is a couple uncontrollable factors that lead humans to eat and controllable factors, factors that we can modify. And I'm going to focus on glycemia as one of them. So there are several things we can't control, right? If you have grandmas, if, if, if I had a pizza right now, Okay, how many people would start salivating uncontrollably? I can't see all of you, but you can virtually raise your hand if you're paying attention, right? How many, you know, well, nobody's paying attention. All right, so all of you would start salivating without your control. And now that is a cephalic phase response. Your heart rate will actually go up. Your uh, blood pressure will change, right? Like you'll have physiologic changes you cannot control. So you cannot expect to tell people that, hey, look, it, I'm going to be able to take away the fact that when you're staring at food, you're going to want it. When you're out and your friends recommend food, right, and, say, and trigger you to eat, try this cookie, try this cake, have some dessert with me. These are cues we cannot get rid of, right? We can't get rid of those, right? So the social cues, the food cues to eat, and we cannot change the way our brain rewards food, right? Our brains reward that those uh, that brain reward, everybody thinks they have unique food preferences. No, the brain has a very concrete reward structure, right? And that's carbon fat combinations. And we'll talk about that. So you have to tell your patients, you cannot change what it is that your brain wants, right? But there are certain hungers that you can mitigate. And we'll talk about that. And I want to talk today about the hunger induced by glycemic variability. Show of hands real quick, how many of you guys have prescribed the CGM, a continuous glucose monitor? Has anybody prescribed uh, a, a, a continuous glucose monitor? Wow, no participation. I'm really that boring, guys. Oh, we got one. Tina Rose gave a thumbs up. Never. Okay, so uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about what continuous uh, 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 glucose monitors are and why they're important, because there's something we've understood about glycemic variability blood sugar going up and then coming back down all the way since 1950. And we haven't put it into clinical practice. And I want to talk about it today. And I want to show you the amount of information we have supportive of this. So how many people, since you all are participating now, have eaten pizza, okay? You've had two slices. Three hours later, you find yourself uh, hungry again. And the cold pizza tastes better than when you had the warm pizza three hours before. Has that happened to anybody? Kim says yes, okay? Or has anybody had Chinese food and you tried not to eat it all, 
right? And then three or four hours later, you're eating the cold leftovers and you're like, oh my God, this actually tastes better. Janet's like, you know, saying no, but has anybody experienced that? So Kaylee says, yep. Janet says no, but okay. So there's a common phenomenon, okay, of postprandial hunger after you eat, right? You get hungry for more, right? People often experience this. You'll ask patients who suffer from obesity, they'll almost universally say, yes, for some reason, that cold pizza tastes better. I don't know why, but why does this happen, right? Why does this happen? And we'll talk about this. Why does that Chinese leftover sometimes taste better to some people? Okay, and we're going to talk about this, right? If you want your patient to lose weight, you have to explain to them what are their drivers of eating. And back in 1953, in the New England Journal of Medicine, Meyer said, hey, wait a second, falling blood sugar makes the brain hungry, right? This is back in 1953, where he described this. And basically, he put people uh, on, uh, he gave them different foods, and he raised their blood sugar, and he watched as that blood sugar come down, and he asked them how hungry they were. And you can see here in the gray bars, he was measuring hunger in relation to the blood sugar falling. It was the first time ever described in the medical literature when, that, when the blood sugar falls, a patient gets hungry. And we all have experienced that. How many people have uh, seen a patient overdose on insulin or sulfonylurea? Give too much insulin, come in with symptomatic hypoglycemia. Just raise your hand if you've seen a patient with symptomatic hypoglycemia. Yes, yes, okay, yes, raise your hand. Tina says yes, okay. And what do they say? What do they say in the hospital? They say, get me juice, get me soda, get me ice cream, get me crackers. Is that, does that sound right? Just shake your head or give me a yes. Yes, okay. Did anybody ever say, get me the raw vegan broccoli, I'm on a diet, when they're hypoglycemic? Did anybody ever say, uh, get me a plain can of tuna, I'm hypoglycemic, right? No, they never said it. Janet is hilariously laughing. So. When their blood sugar is nice and high, they're not asking for food. When you gave them too much sulfonylurea or insulin and their blood sugar is coming down, all of a sudden their brain is on fire for food, okay? And they're eating chocolate. Some diabetics even carry chocolate with them, right? They carry chocolate because they, their brain is on fire for food. Their reward centers are being activated. So we knew this. We all know this because we experience it in the clinic every day in the hospital every day, we see it with symptomatic hypoglycemia. But even in normal people, this physiology causes hunger. And back in 1953, basically Meyer said, okay, that the glucostatic mechanism suggests, suggested here is uh, one of the most precise regulations for the desire for food and satiety. So uh, fast forward to 1996, okay, they did continued studies on this. They basically showed, this is a great study here where they showed they gave people insulin and they dropped their sugar and they measured if they were, became hungry. And they showed that in, in the presence of mild hypoglycemia with hyperinsulinemia, we can actually make patients more hungry. And here we gave an insulin infusion to a patient and their hunger basically goes off the charts. Here we see when the blood sugar comes down, the hunger goes up, right? This isn't news for you. You guys could have told me that, Charles, we knew this, right? Uh, we knew this. We see it all day in our patients, right? But it's important because it's been ignored, right? We focused on calories. We focused on blaming the patient, and we didn't tell them what is making you hungry, right? Maybe it's the sugar. Maybe it's the carbohydrates that you're eating that are skyrocketing your sugar and then tanking back down. Right, like oral glucose tolerance we give to people all the time. In 1996, a signal for hunger in humans is associated with transient declines in blood glucose. Tro, you're like, any nurse, any first year nursing student could have told you that, right? So yes, they could have. And yet it hasn't translated into anything. So I wanna show you this, the studies continued. Now this is in uh, back in 99, where they literally gave a carbohydrate so that that's great. You're like, Tro, okay, some symptomatic hypoglycemia or mild hypoglycemia can cause hunger. I want to show you how this plays out into the foods we eat. If we taste match and calorie match foods, so we gave people shakes, vanilla shakes, one was carbohydrates and sugar, one was fat. Okay. And all we did was measure their hunger and measure when they get hungry next. So it's same amount of energy. What happens if you have fat it takes a lot longer for you to get hungry than if you have carbohydrates and sugar. 
So sugar makes you more hungry much quicker. Same calories, same energy. Okay, should we be rethinking our low fat approach and our cal low calorie approach for the last 50 years? Possibly. So back in 99, rapid changes in blood glucose are particularly strong signals for meal initiation. This is also in 99. David Ludwig basically took uh, foods with differing glycemic index. So low glycemic index foods like eggs and fruit for breakfast, eggs and berries, and high glycemic index like you know, uh, uh, you know, processed oatmeal, right? And he basically found if you calorie match it, who gets hungrier quicker? Well, the higher your glycemic index, the hungrier you are and the quicker you get more hungry. The lower the glycemic index, the less hunger. Should we be rethinking really our low calorie and our low fat approach? Basically subjects ate 81% more total energy if they consumed instant oatmeal versus two meals of the same, versus the same amount of energy of an omelet and fruit. And even if you took that same oatmeal and just made it like steel cut, they ate less. So directly showing that the faster carbs absorb and the faster carbs get cleared, the more hungry you will get. This is David Ludwig work. In 2011, fast forward to Regina Sinha in Yale. She showed that it only took 20 Cal 20 points of blood sugar, a 20 point drop in blood sugar to activate the reward centers of your brain. The parts of the brain that your diabetics and their hypoglycemic say, give me the juice, give me the chocolate, give me the ice cream, right? The, and all it takes is 20 points of blood sugar. That's it. A 20 point downshift will activate those areas and more so in your obese patients than the normal weight patients, but in both for sure. Meaning that the more diabetic you are, the more obese you are, the more likely it is you are to be suffering from hunger. And they basically said here in this 2011 paper where they did this euglycemic hypoglycemic clamp, this fancy name of saying they gave an insul insulin infusion and put people under functional MRIs and asked them, do you want food? And they said, no, as long as we kept their blood sugar stable. And the minute we dropped their blood sugar 20 points, they're like, we want, we're craving food. And the part of their brains that are lighting up are the addiction areas of the brain, right? The part of your brain that when you're at McDonald's ordering French fries doesn't give a crap, right? That's the part of the brain that's lighting up with a 20 point fluctuation in sugar. And this is 2011, so let's fast forward. Okay, in 2020, we started, uh, this is another study by David Ludwig. He showed it's not just the sugar. When you're on a high carb versus a low carb diet, your total body energies decrease right? Not just your carbohydrates, but also your fat. That insulin is shoving the sugar and shoving the fat into the fat cells. And it's depriving the blood of energy, total energy, right? So this is basically proving what we all know. A high carbohydrate diet during weight loss maintenance lowers energy availability in the late postprandial period, making the brain hungry. And we finally, with the advent of CGM, started showing this. This is an example of a CGM tracing of patients with obesity. And we're able to show that they're not hungry when their blood sugars are really high, but when their blood sugars drop down, they're basically requesting food. So that low blood sugar makes people hungry. Okay. And, so, and just, I just want to comment on that last slide that their blood sugars were not abnormally low. No, it's just the dynamic changes. So that's great that you mentioned it. It's a dynamic change of 20 points going down. That's all it takes to make the brain hungry. And we'll talk about what are the implications of this for people who've had bariatric surgery. So uh, basically, uh, the bottom line is the pre-meal glucose predicts hunger and food intake. And this is in 2019 that we showed this. Now, you're like, okay, Charles, these small little studies are great, but I'm going to get to some bigger ones. This is another study from David Ludwig showing that uh, a low carbohydrate diet doesn't activate those brain reward centers that say, get me more food, right? It's the high carbohydrate diet that does that. So uh, it's actually physiologically sending more blood to the addiction areas of the brain. Now that's all great, but you're like, Tro, generalize this to most people for me. Well, this is a study on 1000 people with CGMs on, okay? Continuous glucose monitors. These are these things, excuse the hairy arms, but it's a little, little meter right here that you put on your arm and it gives you your glucose readings. 
We put 1,000 people on CGMs and we measure what happens. And basically, if you have this postprandial dipping, okay, it's, it predicts weight gain. It predicts your more intake at the next meal and it predicts more intake for the next 24 hours. Okay, this is, this is uh, the use of remote CGMs and remote scales. Right, so basically, if your blood sugar dips, you're much more likely to get hungry. So those patients of yours with obesity who are telling you three hours after eating pizza, I love cold pizza, they're the ones experiencing this. Okay, this is called postprandial dipping. So basically, in a real world setting, postprandial glucose dips in you know eighty thousand meals in one thousand patients showed that it increased hunger, caused weight gain, and increased energy consumption. So think of that diabetic patient I talked to you about who's saying, uh, we've got a little too much insulin, right? And their blood sugar goes low. They say, give me chocolate, ice cream, cookies, candy, or soda. They don't say I'm on a diet, right? They don't say that. So you have to understand their hunger. What's driving this, right? It's those brain reward centers of mild hypoglycemia, okay? Those mild downshifts saying, the, give me awesome food, right? And that's why that, that's why I suppose that cold pizza and Chinese food leftovers taste better. And it just takes 20 points of blood sugar drop, decline, a 20 point drop, okay, to stimulate the reward centers of the brain. Not much, not much. So maybe this could explain why gastric by bypass patients gain weight because the brain doesn't care about what you did to the stomach. A person can have an anvil in their stomach. Off, what happens at Thanksgiving? Thanksgiving dinner, everybody's full, right? Everybody's full, they're, they're, they're asleep, they're tired, they're so stuffed, right? But what happens two hours later, okay? Those blood sugars come crashing back down and everybody's eating like all over again and the dessert's out and everybody's eating like they didn't eat before, right? So there is a phenomenon, okay, that drives humans to eat related to glycemic shifts. And if you see that a patient with obesity has a problem controlling their intake, Stop blaming them. Tell them there's another way. You can lower the glycemic index. You can lower your carbohydrates, okay? And you will be less hungry, right? You'll be less hungry. And we, you know, I'm bringing up the data here. This is important because this is the different bariatric procedures, okay? This is gastric banding, rarely done anymore. This is surgical sleeve, rarely done anymore. Uh, well, more, uh, sorry, more favorable now, but this is the ruin Y bypass they produce about 10, 20, and 30% weight loss, okay? But you'll see after a year, everybody gains weight, okay? Because the brain doesn't give a crap about what you did in the stomach. You can have an anvil in your stomach. Think about that hypoglycemic patient, okay? You can put an anvil in their stomach, but if you give them sugar and give them too much insulin and the blood sugar comes down, their brain is saying, I want more food. I want more food, right? So you have to understand, are we addressing the, the root cause. So our clinic is one of the highest volume prescribers of CGMs for weight loss, prediabetes, and diabetes, and our internal audits corroborate these findings, okay? That in fact, our first goal for patients who want to lose weight or are pre-diabetics and are diabetics is how stable can you get your sugar? We don't care about weight loss, right? So they come in, they say, Tro, I want to lose weight. And I say, great, let's stabilize your blood sugar first. Okay, let's stabilize your blood sugar first and let's use a CGM as a tool to help you do it. Okay, so I'm going to move on to some other causes of hunger. We talked about that cephalic uh, phase response, like the food cues. You have to tell them, look, I can't make food not be awesome for you. I cannot take that hunger away when you're staring at the pizza, right? I can't take that away. That is on you. But I can tell you that if you have those carbohydrates in that pizza, Three hours later, when your blood sugar is tanking, you're going to want more pizza. I can give you that bit of information. I can't take that away. Your, your organs, your pancreas, when you see food, is already making insulin. When, you're, when your uh, salivary glands are churning out saliva, your pancreas is making insulin, literally driving people to eat. Imagine taking food out of somebody's hand, right? What are they going to do? They're going to say, hey, give me that back, right? They're anticipating that food. You're not going to be able to do that, but you can at least let them know, hey, look, if you eat this food, you're going to be more hungry two to three hours later. 
you better be ready with a bottle of water and ready to go, right? Have your decaf coffee ready to go because you're going to be starving and you better have some other defense, okay, if you turn to foods like that. So the other thing that I want to talk about is the social cues to eat. And I think this is really important because these aren't going away. We have business meetings, we have grand rounds or pizza. I mean, how many times have they given crap food at the hospital? We all know this, right? In my doctor's lounge, there's chips. It's a shame. It's a really a shame that we do this, right? We do the pizza, the, the chips, the kind bars, and it's just beyond me that we do this to ourselves, okay? Uh, so we have to start the change. So we have to say, you're not gonna be able to get rid of those social cues, okay? You have to be clear with them. I can't get rid of those but we can help you defend against them. I wanna bring up this video. This is from the New England Journal of Medicine. Obesity spreads like a virus. Complex ways. Okay, you'll see here how obesity spreads over the 25 years. More compact how basically, the, more ties appear. basically, let me pause this for a second and, and tell you what's going on. Network. So over 25 years, you'll see that obesity spreads throughout the entire Framingham study, okay? But it spreads like a virus in clusters. Right, so the people who are obese have obese friends and obese family and obese, and that is how obesity spreads. And you have these small little pockets of like people who are healthy, maybe people who are all doing a diet together, maybe people who are all you know pushing each other, maybe a church congregation that focuses on diet as well, maybe a you know a CrossFit gym, right? But in general, throughout our society, obesity has spread like a wildfire. It's just time. spread the entire network. Quantitative analysis okay, and you'll see that kind of here. For obese people um, this is from the New England Journal of Medicine. I highly recommend you watch this video on so how obesity spreads study, like a virus. It is a social a disease. Price. I'm going to move on here. So what are tactics you can tell your patients? Guy, look, if you're going to Christmas dinner, if you're going to Halloween, look, if you're going to Halloween, just take the sugar out of the chocolate. Get yourself some Lily's chocolate. It tastes like chocolate, but it has no sugar. Okay. It's not like a, it's not a diet food, but at least it doesn't have that component, right? If you're going to a family gathering, bring some berries with you, mixed berries for dessert. So you can have a low glycemic index dessert compared to, you know, the fruit tart that was going to be there that you couldn't say no to. At least now you have a defense that you brought. So thinking defensively of how to eat. Uh, it's something to consider. Now, the last thing I want to tell, a couple of the last things I want to touch on is that the, what does the brain crave? Okay. The, what you have to understand about what the brain craves, it basically craves carbs and fat put together. This is the brain's food reward structure, right? Nobody eats binges on plain baked potato, although some people could. Okay. What do they do? They take the baked potato. Okay. And they put a bunch of sour cream and butter on it. Nobody binges on butter. I've never seen somebody take sticks of butter and just eat it, right? But you give them a potato and they can eat plenty of butter. I've never seen anybody take butter and just binge on it, but you give them a loaf of bread, that whole butter is gone. And I've never met anybody to guzzle olive oil. Has anybody met anybody to guzzle olive oil? It's not the high fat, but you give them bread and what happens to that olive oil? It's gone, right? It's gone, okay? so. You know, you have to understand for the most part, it's not the fat. It's how you combine the fat with the carbs. What's a potato chip? Potato fried in oil. What's French fries? Potato fried in oil. Okay. It is the carb fat combination that tells the brain to keep eating. Okay. So if you ate a baked potato, most people would just eat one, right? If you give them French fries, they'll eat three potatoes. Blood sugar goes up, smashes back down, and they're eating more. So you have to understand this reward structure. Your brain will take the soda, the juice, the gummy bears. It'll take that. Who here can guzzle olive oil? Anybody? Who here can eat raw beef fat? Is there anybody here that can gain weight eating raw beef fat? No, it's not the fat, right? It's how we use the fat, right? It's how we use the fat. Okay, so the brain's reward, how do we know what the brain's reward is? Basically, we've done functional MRI studies showing that, okay, your brain likes carbs, kind of likes fat, but it much prefers the combination. In fact, people will reward that combina combination dis-synergistically, meaning you give them bread, they'll pay a buck or two bucks. You give them butter, they'll pay a buck, maybe two bucks. You give them bread and butter, they'll pay five bucks, 
right? Okay, so the combination of car carbs and fat has been shown on functional MRIs to light up the reward centers. The, the pragmatic financial reward has been shown and the Yale food addiction model also shows that if you look at the top 10 most addictive foods, chocolate, ice cream, French fries, pizza, cookie, chips, cake, popcorn, cheeseburger, they're all carb and fat combinations, almost down the line, 50% carbs, 50% fat, very void of protein, right? So the bottom line is you have to tell your, your patients, right? If you're trying to eat less, you don't wanna combine your carbs and your fat, okay? You wanna keep them miles apart. It's not the fat, fat isn't the problem. It's when you pair the fat with the carbs. And when you do that, you're gonna eat more carbs and you're gonna be more hungry three hours later, okay? That is the food matrix or your patients are stuck in. And if you don't understand the systems of control that keep your patients eating, you're not gonna be able to help them out of it. All right, the last thing I wanna talk about, I hope this is the last one, is stress-induced hyperphagia. We have thousands of patients on remote scales, remote blood pressure cuffs, remote CGMs, Okay, and we have found that stressful events are huge predictors of weight gain. And what happens? We can see it on a blood glucose meter. Their blood sugar shoots up and comes back down. They're not hungry when the bear's chasing them or their boss is yelling at them or their patients are crashing. They're hungry afterwards when they're decompressing, sitting at home, staring TV, and the haagen is in the fridge. When the blood sugars fall, okay, that's when they're getting hungry. Right? These are very vulnerable times for patients, and you have to tell them you cannot get rid of stress-induced hyperphagia. If you're stressed out, you will be hungry. You have to anticipate it. You need a better strategy. Okay, If you're doing ice cream, do low-carb ice cream. If you're doing chocolate, do low-sugar chocolate. Right? Just make a modest improvement. Okay, Modest improvements. But you need to tell them you can't get rid of these signals. They're ingrained signals. Okay. And you have to understand it's not a, it's not, it, it is a comfort deficiency. You, so you're, you're glycemically uh, uh, triggered to eat with the, the stress, literally, what does it do? The glucose produces blood sugar, right? As a response from cortisol and epinephrine, the blood sugar goes up, the heart rate goes up, the blood pressure goes up, right? And what happens when the bear's chasing them, they're not hungry. It's when it stops, when that stress becomes a chronic stress or a post-stress, right? Where all those blood flow changes in the brain from the stress hormones are going to the fight or flight areas of the brain. And those changes take hours to reverse. Okay. The, the part of their brain that's lighting up is the get me awesome or get me out of there. It's not the parts that, you know, light up when they're meditating, when they're studying, when they're praying, right? The parts that want to be good when they're under stress, they're literally getting blood to the get me awesome areas of the brain. So if you can't tell them, and explain to them that it's not their fault and it's normal and every animal that we know experiences the same thing, right? Take away that shame and then give them tools, right? This is what you have to do. Stress will make you hungry. It makes every animal hungry, okay? You will need tools, okay? Slight improvements from whatever's going on. You're not going to be asking, you're not going to, it's not going to work to get just plain tuna and vegan broccoli when you're stressed out. So you have to meet your patients where they are. If they're having problems with chocolate, get them lilies. If they're having problems with cookies, get them a low carb or an almond flour cookie, something slightly better. Okay, if you can get them eating the vegan broccoli, great, push them that way. But most of the time, our patients need to step off of ice cream and chips. You Quest has a line of low carb chips you can use. Um, Halo Top has a low sugar ice cream. Okay, so you have to find them alternatives for what their struggles are, right? And where we start in our practice is what are your problem foods? What are your problem places? Who are your problem people? And where are your problem situations? And we ask them to write them down. And once they give us those 15 things that they struggle with, we work with them one by one to figure out something modestly better. And that's it. That's the magic right there. What do you struggle with? How can I help you? Okay, what are the foods, places, people, situations you struggle with? And can we come up with pragmatic plans to help you? Okay, basically stress is a disaster for eating and people will eat whatever is available. So if you don't change their environment, they're gonna eat foods that make them more hungry. And Kevin Hall basically showed that. 
Kevin Hall showed that our food environment of processed food makes you eat 600 calories more. This is in 2019. He gave them the same amount of energy. If you had basically salmon and rice, okay, and I'm not that I'm telling you to eat rice versus a hamburger, right, which is basically the same amount of carbs and fat, right, just having minimally processed food, okay, made people eat less. So not only can you advise them, hey, look, you know, if you want to eat filling foods, eat meat, fish, chicken, eggs, Greek yogurt, green leafy vegetables, and berries. If you have to eat hyperpalatable food, chocolate, ice cream, you know, chips, cookies, cake, make it a low sugar, low carb version. That is the advice we typically give. And Kevin Hall showed just the lower processing of food will lead to 600 calories less a day. And I'm going to skip this last one. Okay. It's another hunger you need to be aware about, but it's the fact that even after eating a filling meal, people will always crave something salty or something sweet. Who craves something sweet after dinner, right? Even though you're full, right? You still have a craving, right? And that process, okay. It's not your patients having, you know, gluttony. It is an ingrained signal in every animal we've ever tested. If, they f if a bear has filled up on salmon, when they're hyperphagic, a bear eats 30,000 calories in a day, okay, what does it crave afterwards? It could eat another 100 pounds of blueberries, okay, because it's a different taste, a different texture. It wouldn't eat more salmon, okay? It wouldn't eat more salmon, right? It's done. It's had its fair share. But if you give it a different texture and a different taste, it'll eat more. So what you have to understand is variety, okay, and a differing texture and a differing taste will always make you eat more, okay? You have to know this so you can educate your patients, okay? So that's something to consider. It's not their willpower deficiency. They shouldn't be ashamed and, you know, uh, they shouldn't feel uh, every animal we've ever looked at, right? Think of your dog, your pet dog at home. You give them a bunch of steak, they eat the steak, and then an hour later, you give it more steak. It's not as interested. And then an hour later, you give it more steak and it's like, I'm done. I can't even eat this, right? But you do the bunch of steak and then you give it cheese. What happens? He keeps eating. And then you give it a dog treat an hour later. What happens? He keeps eating, right? So we know this, but how can we make it there to tell our patients they don't have to be ashamed. They don't have to be guilty. These are normal signals. And we can take those signals and change them, right? So, okay, you want something sweet afterwards. Get it like a get like a flavored salsa or something, right? Or just get out of the house. It's not a real signal. That sensory specific satiety, that, that, uh, you know, that signal to have that dessert, it's not a real signal, right? If you go away for an hour, you're not going to come rushing back for that sweet taste. So what we tell people is if you can make a change, go to low carb chocolate or low carb ice cream. If you can't do, you know, if you could do something even better, drink like a flavored seltzer. That may hit the spot or get out of the kitchen, get out of the home, right? It's not a real hunger signal in an hour, you'll forget about it, okay? And most of all, you shouldn't be ashamed or embarrassed because every animal has it. But you guys are all like, Tro, our patients don't wanna sit here for an hour. We don't have an hour to explain them to, you know, all these things. So be careful, make sure you, if you wanna educate your patients, assess their readiness to change. You know, use, like, use some motivational interviewing. You will know who can do this, who will benefit from this knowledge and who won't. If they're not interested in their care and you know, they're just kind of you know, not telling you about their struggles with weight and their desire to do more, it's probably best not to push them in an intervention they're not ready for. So you may wanna consider other things like medications. And so this is a meta-analysis from 2016. Up to 2016, basically Fenterman and Topiramate were the best option we had. Lorcaserin has since been pulled off the market for its association with cancer. And that topiramate fentramine combination, it makes people not hungry. And you lose about 10% of your body weight, which is not nothing. So you may want to consider this. Just be careful. Fentramine has some issues with glaucoma and uh, um, you know, racing heart. So if you have somebody with an arrhythmia, um, you, know, you may want to consider that. And it makes people dopey. They call topiramate dopamax, right? Because it makes people a little stupid. You know, that's what they complain about. Okay. Um, so, you know, we showed you that graph of surgery, even, even people on drugs, right? They just gain weight after a year, right? We're not addressing the cause. <clears throat> we have to educate our patients on what's leading them to eat. 
So just remember, it's not a magic bullet. They will gain weight after they lose weight and you need to be able to support them throughout their time. Do not just prescribe and send away. You have to support them, okay? All throughout this process, right? Um, this is a duplicate, I don't know why. And there's new hope. <clears throat> the GLP-1s are amazing drugs. Okay, they're amazing drugs for people who are not motivated, don't have, are disinterested and have diabetes, by the way, this is a no brainer. So maglutide, which is Ozempic, which is Wagovi, which is Ribelis, it can produce 17% uh, uh, weight loss, which is a, a great amount. And guess how it works? It makes the insulin release more efficiently and makes your blood sugar more stable. Where have we heard that mechanism before? Maybe for the last 60 years, we ignored it uh, by ridiculing Atkins. Okay, so what to know about GLP-1? Um, be careful, it has a slight uh, predisposition to those with thyroid cancer. Uh, they saw a signal in Worcester rats that, that it, it caused some thyroid issues. Uh, be careful when your patients who drink alcohol, you know, if it makes insulin release more efficiently, it basically tickles the pancreas. So. If you have patients with concomitant alcohol use, they can get pancreatitis. And even if you put them on the drug, and it's there are times that our drugs are very useful. If a patient's unable to make other changes and you don't want them to get surgery, um, you know this is something to consider to use. But you know you have to give support. Never give up on dietary support. You have to support your patients. Keep them close. So just to give a summary, I'm glad I did this in an hour. I didn't think I would do it. Tracking, logging, and calculating calories is not a superior approach to weight loss. It's potentially detrimental. It hasn't worked in 50 years. Maybe we should stop. Consider instead educating your patients about the physiologic drives to eat. If a patient has failed at a low calorie, Weight Watchers, low fat approach, consider instead low carbohydrate or intermittent fasting. Um, Diet Doctor is a commercial company. I have no affiliation with them. I have no relationship to them, uh, but they're an excellent resource for people looking for low carb diets. These are highly motivated people who are interested. If you're interested in learning about metabolic health and low carbohydrate diets and inter intermittent fasting and how you can put that into your practice, visit. I'm on the board for the not-for-profit Metabolic Practitioner Society. So you can visit that website. If you're going to advise weight loss to a patient, be familiar with the tools and the support necessary to make these changes possible. Support, support, support. There are surgery medications, but also support, support, support. We have patients on remote scales, remote blood pressure cuffs, and remote continuous glucose monitors, and we will call them if we see a five-pound weight gain. We are tracking that data. And we will say, hey, how can we help you? Do you really want to sit through this bald, crazy guy for another, you know, another visit? You know, we try to reach out to them, give them groups, um, cohort them. We're developing an app so that patients who are struggling with weight can help each other and connect with each other because we see that obesity spreads in social networks and is cured through social networks. So use your practice as a as a you know, I, I, uh, church or an, you know, I don't know how to the temple to basically promote healthy eating, right? Healthy eating, lower the sugar, lower the processed carbohydrates. And if they've failed other approaches, you know, consider something else, consider something else. Thank you. I think that's it. Yeah, that's it. Okay, that was fantastic. I would call, I would call that Dr. Tro light because I know that you stayed m more in the, what shall I say, um, politically correct sphere of how to yeah, we wanna, understand obesity. Yeah, look, bottom line is, is we're, we're terrible. We have all failed, right? That's the bottom line, okay? If we want to put it on our patients. It's our patients, they're not interested, they can't do it, you know, but, it, it is our job. It is our job to help them. And if this was plane crashes, we wouldn't allow it to happen. If it was, you know, um, if it was a medication causing obesity, we wouldn't keep prescribing it the same way. Um, we are the problem. Okay. And we have mm -hmm. to start being part of that solution. And it starts with understanding that it's multifaceted and layered, but also 
you know, genetics didn't all of a sudden change in 1950, right? Okay, it's not genetics, right? It's basically, you know, if you, <laughs> it's the amount of, you know, what I tell people is in 1950, how many things, how many meal options were at McDonald's, right? Now there's like a million. How many cereals were down the cereal aisle, right? Now there's a million. How many chips were there down the chip aisle, right? So the, the problem is it's the food environment. And if we don't tell our patients how to deal with it, these are highly addictive substances, okay? And if we don't educate our patients on how to deal with it, and if we don't know how to deal with it ourselves, we're never gonna be able to help them. And if we're not empathetic to what that person with obesity is struggling with, you're never gonna be able to reach them. They don't wanna come to you. They don't wanna see you. Right. You're chronically thin. You're going to tell them to lose weight and, and count their calories and move more. And they're, they're just, they're not going to even want to open up, right? It's kind of like alcoholism, right? And in fact, we do a cage questionnaire. Who's done a cage questionnaire on alcoholism? Anybody? We don't, we don't, we don't, everybody's hiding away. Today. Yeah. So, yeah. so yeah. you've done a cage questionnaire, right? Anybody? So do a cage questionnaire with food on yourself, do it. Do you wanna cut down on food? <laughs> Some people do, most people do, right? They wanna cut down, right? Do you get agitated? If your husband or wife comes and snatches the food out of your mouth, says you're on a diet, you shouldn't eat that. Are you saying, yes, yes, of course I don't wanna, I don't wanna eat this, you're helping me. Or are you agitated and pissed off that they took that food away from you, right? Do you feel guilty sometimes about the things you ate? I really shouldn't have eaten that chocolate. I really shouldn't have had that pizza at Grand Rounds, right? And E is the eye opener, which we really shouldn't use. Uh, so for alcohol, that's like feeling uh, compelled to drink at an early time. But with eating it, do you sneak food? Do you eat it late at night? Do you eat it when nobody's looking? Do you eat by yourself? Do you, you know, uh, do you hide the wrappers, right? And that's like how what I'd say for eye opener. And if one of your patients gets four out of four for that, you are dealing with an addictive substance, right? They are dealing with an addictive substance for them. And you have to be compassionate, have good advice, know what you're doing so that you can deal with it, right? So that you can deal with it. So I think um, it's hard. It's hard. Most of our patients aren't ready to hear that. They're not ready to hear, um, you know, you're not, they're not ready to hear that message. You know, and there's so much. Tell, tell Anne. Yeah. Anne asked about peer support in your practice. Tell Anne about your um, group coaching. Yeah. So. Uh, Isn't that what you do? Yeah, we do. We have several. We have small groups and big groups. I mean, we have individual coaching, but but the bottom line is, is we try to, you know, we try to break those barriers. Imagine you're hiding the cereal boxes and the candy wrappers from your family. This is something very private, emotional, guilt-ridden. You don't want to open up. And when you're in a group environment where 70 other people are just like you, sharing their vulnerabilities and strategies, right? you begin to open it up and you begin to bring these things out. Just like an alcoholic doesn't want to go tell their spouse you know, husband or wife, like I'm drinking because they don't want to, you know, let them down and they feel shame and guilt. A lot of people with obesity have those intense feelings. And so it's important to break down those barriers. And uh, we have a big group. We have a group that meets weekly, consider it like a binge eating group. And then we have small groups where we cluster off five patients with each other. And they, they, you know, if they agree to it and we, uh, we kind of, it's like a, a group counseling basically with food and food strategies. You know, what, what made you hungry? What made you full? What foods are making you eat more? What situations are making you eat more? What is a better way you could have handled it? Did you handle it well? You know, a lot of times patients with obesity aren't good judges of themselves. So we give them um, kind of an outside perspective. Uh, the continuous glucose monitors are an amazing tool, adjunct tool, because it lets you uh, problem solve. Hey, I noticed on Wednesday you had a blood sugar spike. What was going on? Is there something we could have gotten you to make that easy? Oh, I was at pizza at Grand Rounds at, you know, University Hospitals of Cincinnati. And, you know, I didn't know what to do. Well, why don't you pack a protein bar, or two protein bars? I kid you not. I was a obese hospitalist. I had a Nutribullet in the doctor's lounge with a, with a chocolate 
uh, protein powder, right? It's because the, how often do you go to nurse's station? There's chocolate and donuts and cookies. I needed something chocolatey, compelling enough, right? That would keep me away from the crap at the nursing station, right? And the doctor's lounge. So um, come up with creative solutions based on those vulnerabilities you see. So the CGM could be a big eye opener for the patient. And then it's, it's you know, we're so, you know, that, that evil metal box that we all step on, people have a terrible relationship with the scale, right? And so to have another device to interact with that people aren't so, and that's more real time and it shows you your blood sugar fluctuations. This is why you were hungry after you ate that pizza. You know, this is what that pizza did to your blood sugar. I mean, it is like an amazing tool to really engage patients who are interested and engage themselves. And it's also helpful because as a coach, somebody who's helping them uh, manage strategies for eating, it helps you identify vulnerabilities and give them tools. So a CGM is amazing. Uh, if your patients are pre-diabetic or diabetic and have commercial insurance, it'll be covered. I think it'll cost them like 50 bucks. Um, it costs our practice about $70 and we pass that off basically at cost to our patients. So um, we either send them a script or ship them out a CGM. It is an amazing tool. If you have a diabetic patient, they, every diabetic patient should be on one. Every single one. They will not eat the same. And your, your advice of... Um, you know, eat whole grains and fruits and orange juice and whole wheat toast. I'm telling you, you will change your recommendations when you see what it does to your diabetic patients. You will not say the same thing. You just won't. Sorry. Or even what it would do to a non-diabetic patient. <laughs> you would be surprised. You'd be surprised. I yeah. think uh, someone from our office shared their CGM recently uh, where, you know, it was like a handful of grapes shot up their sugar to 200 for over two hours. They basically failed an oral glucose tolerance test and they're not diabetic and their A1C was fine. Right. So I guess <laughs> they would be considered diabetic by the ADA, but, um, now, but, uh, they wouldn't have known that, you know, they wouldn't have, their A1C wasn't, wasn't even pre-diabetic. Um, anyway, any other questions? Um, what do you eat in a day? What do I eat in a day? Oh, I had uh, green beans and ground beef uh, and like eight eggs for breakfast and lunch. That was my breakfast and lunch. Sure. I probably won't have dinner. I very frequently, I eat about six meals a week or maybe maximum 10 meals a week. I'm just not hungry. And when I eat, yeah. I want to have a big pound of steak and my cholesterol is better than it's ever been. My HDL went from 30 to 90. My triglycerides from 300 to 50. And my LDL is lower than it's ever been eating steak and eggs. So I would tell you to well, question what people have told you. And uh, I, we're, we're in an era with, um, we have point of care uh, labs and, and people, your patients and yourself can get real-time advice on your own cholesterol, real-time advice on your uh, blood glucose. So I would say just be inquisitive and challenge uh, your assumptions. I personally um, had surgical menopause at age 42. And when I discovered you all, I was in this cycle of, I couldn't eat anything. I, if I ate more than a thousand calories a day, I would gain weight. I exercise all the time. And I was miserable, like I was moody and couldn't sleep. And when I eliminated carbohydrates, processed, particularly processed carbohydrates from my diet and started giving my body what it wanted, I can eat between two and 3,000 calories a day and haven't changed my workout at all. And I'm leaner than I've ever been. And my lipids are great so yeah, well, i'm that, just saying I would... on that you know actually uh so david ludwig also showed that your metabolism increases on average by about 300 calories a day when you compare low carb to high carb diets so he put people on a controlled feeding study where he gave people low carb medium carb high carb diet and those on the low carb diet actually increased their energy expenditure by about 300 calories a day just on average 
meaning like these people felt well, better and just moved and it wasn't a you know like they burned more energy for no specific reason um so definitely there are metabolic impacts of low carb eating that are are now recognized um but weren't until two years ago when the study was published and the mood change has been just dramatic and i feel like I want everybody to experience it for themselves. And that's why I feel very passionate about it. So I really appreciate you coming today to do this for us. Yeah, no problem. Just so you know, there are actually interventional trials showing, okay, they've taken uh, patients, put them on a low fat and low carb diet, showing that knee arthritis pain goes down. Okay, they've shown that chronic pain goes down on a low carbohydrate diet. And I kid you not, they've taken people and put them on a real food diet, okay? And it is yeah. interventionally, and it has lowered their depression about as much as our SSRIs, okay? So why am I bringing this up? If you have a highly motivated patient, right? These, these changes will affect their whole body, right? Typically highly educated, uh, patients like doctors and nurses, like you and me, right? Okay, uh, do incredibly well. It is a challenge in a standard clinic to get people to do this. Um, you have to assess your patient's readiness to change. You have to determine, okay, who can make a major change and then push the ones that can be pushed and bite your tongue for those people because most people aren't ready to hear this. Right, they're not ready to hear that McDonald's is addictive and Krispy Kreme is addictive, and you're overweight and you're killing yourself. They're not ready to hear that because that message is going to bring about shame, guilt, and uh, it, so it's really important as a provider that we assess readiness to change. Okay, on the people that really like you know can be can be helped and put our energy there. Otherwise, you're going to burn out. You're going to burn out. Mm -hmm. um but you'll know you guys we'll know we know we have a sixth sense of like you know especially after a taver you know they had a major procedure everybody wants to change right so you know yeah. so you know everybody wants like that's the ideal time you know you just had surgery let's get your life fixed you know um yeah were there any more questions Uh, I don't, I don't see any, a lot of our computers don't have, uh, cameras or microphones, so they can watch the, you know, presentation and chat in the chat box, but they can't say anything. <laughs> so I apologize for that. You know? Yeah. The two book I see here, somebody asked for books, uh, obesity code by Dr. Jason Fung. And the big fat surprise by Nina Teicholz. These are, you know, if you're, these are like diet books for, for uh, you know, patients or or even yourself. Honestly, they're they're helpful. Um, thank you so much for having me. Was there any other questions? Thank you for your time. You're welcome. Uh